Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for coming in on this very beautiful day. And I'm very happy to welcome you all to Trishita and to this um, afternoon's talk. My name is Truptin Wangdu and I'm very happy to be here again. I just came back two days ago from Bodh Gaya and it's great to be back in the, in the mountains. Although it's a bit fresh, but that's, that's good. That's wonderful. I'm happy to welcome you to this afternoon's talk, uh, which has the title Freedom Through Understanding, How to Use Our Potential Wisely. And Freedom Through Understanding is also the title of a book, actually, by uh, two Tibetan Buddhist Lamas, namely Lama Yeshe and Lama Zoba Rinpoche, which um, draws from the teachings that they gave in 1975 on their first European tour. So on their first tour, they gave teachings on the Buddhist path to happiness and liberation. And these were collected together in a very wonderful booklet. And, you know, just reading this title for me, Freedom, Freedom Through Understanding, it always filled me with inspiration, actually. Because these three words, they already contain the entire Buddha Dharma, actually, the essence of the whole Buddhist path. They say, you know, actually already, what the whole Buddhist path, Buddhism, is all about. You know, it says, if you want to be free, then you have to understand, right? If you want to have peace of mind, freedom of mind, then you need to understand your mind. You need to know, basically. So, I would like to talk about this a little bit today and offer some, some thoughts on that. So, in general, you see, the Buddha Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha, aims to provide methods for us, techniques, that we can use to become more genuinely happy human beings. To be able to develop a sense of happiness, a sense of contentment that is stable, that is lasting, that is with us in here, wherever we go, whatever we do. And this is something that derives from, it arises from clearly understanding how things are. When we clearly see, when we clearly understand how things are, meaning understanding the nature of reality, how we ourselves as human beings exist, you know, how our minds function, and when we understand how things around us exist, how the world exists, phenomena, other people, how they function, what their actual nature is. When we understand this clearly, when we really see this, then we can begin to live our life in harmony with that understanding. And it is this, actually, where happiness comes from, you see. Understanding the nature of reality and living in harmony with that understanding, putting our actions of body, speech and mind in harmony with that, seeing things clearly and living in accordance with this clear seeing. Because at the moment, we do not see things clearly, the Buddha discovered. At the moment, we do not live in harmony with reality. At the moment, actually, there is a disconnect between how things are and how we hold them to be. There is a discrepancy, a discordance, a disharmony between how things exist and how we grasp them to be. And it is this very disconnect, this discrepancy, which causes us suffering, which causes us problems, discontentment. For example, you know, we see ourselves and the things around us, the world, 
people, places, things, situations, we see these things as being somewhat stable, you know, somewhat non-changing. Non things appear quite solid and permanent, actually. Whereas in actual fact, everything is completely impermanent. Everything is completely changing, not staying the same at all, in a constant state of flux. So because of this basic misconception, for example, seeing things as stable and unchanging, whereas in fact they are not, due to that, this leads us to develop unrealistic expectations towards things in our lives. Our friends, our families, our partners, our possessions, material things, our career, our social status and what have you. We expect all these things to last and not change, very intuitively. We expect them to give us a sense of security, to give us a sense of stability in life, to give us a stable sense of happiness, right? But then, when things, people, situations suddenly change, which is their very nature, right? We get completely distraught. We are so shocked. We are so confused because we expected them to last. We expected them to stay with us. And then suddenly life changes and we lose what we so strongly cherished as lasting and stable and this causes us suffering, disappointment, isn't it? So this suffering, this disappointment then, it comes from having looked at things in a mistaken way. No? Not understanding their actual impermanent nature on a fundamental level. So, you know, it actually comes from the reason why we suffer is because we expect things to give, we expect things or people or situations to give us something which they can't provide for us. It's actually very interesting if you think about that, you know. So therefore, when we start to investigate and to accept a little bit more the nature of things, actually understanding them more clearly, their impermanent nature, for example, this will provide us with tools in the mind to experience less disappointment, less suffering. Like that, the Buddhist practices, Buddhism in general, is a practical method for us to become more realistic, to see things more clearly. The more realistic we are, the more happiness we are able to experience, the Buddha would say. Buddhist practice means looking at things deeply, analyzing their way of existence through Inquiry, like scientific observation actually, really checking things out and then looking inside and to our own minds, analyzing how we perceive things, you know, and then we check, okay, do how things exist and how I perceive them, are they actually in accordance with each other or not? You follow me? You know? Is that in harmony or not? If not, if we come to the conclusion through our own analysis that the way we grasp things to be and how they actually are is discordant, is not in harmony, then we can clearly recognize no, that dissatisfaction and suffering is something that comes from our own minds, from our own mistaken perception, from our own wrong perspective, perceiving things incorrectly, you see that a bit? Does it make sense a bit? It's then our own responsibility, actually, to arrange that, to shift our own mistaken views, correct them, if we want to be happy. It's that what Buddhism is all about, basically. 
to move from a mistaken view, mistaken perception, to a right view. To move from a confused view about reality to a correct view of reality. This is what actually will lead us to experience genuine happiness, genuine fulfillment. So from the Buddhist perspective, both happiness and suffering come from the mind. If we see things correctly or not. Yeah. Actually, nothing from the outside can make you suffer or make you happy. It's your own perspective about things that will make you suffer or happy. It's something interesting to think about. It's not how we usually see things. The whole point about the Buddhist path, moving from a mistaken view to a right view, means to free ourselves from confusion through understanding. In this way, according to the Buddha, real freedom, genuine happiness, fulfillment, contentment, joy, confidence, all these things that we wish for, that we want and need in our lives, do not actually come from outside things as such. They don't actually arise from nice material things or sense pleasures from beautiful places, not even from other people, actually. But the main source of our freedom, our happiness, is an integrated, developed, understanding mind. So these three words actually point to this. They point to our potential as human beings. That as human beings, we have the potential to free ourselves completely from any form of emotional suffering, any disturbing mind state, and become completely, perfectly, lastingly happy. Which in Buddhist terms means attaining a state of liberation and enlightenment. That's what it means, really. That's our potential. Nothing less. Okay. We can all do this. How? You see, here we are at Tushita, in this uh, meditation hall, and you might look around and think, well, this is a religious temple, right? For religious people, probably, doing prayers and rituals and religious practices, for religious reasons, following a religious goal. And there sits this monk, speaking to me, right? Right, I mean, that's how it appears to us. But you see, I think it's very important to recognize that Buddhism, although it does indeed have religious aspects to it, which, when understood correctly, have incredible meaning and yeah, an incredible depth, if we understand them, but Buddhism itself is not considered to be a religion as such, actually. Buddhism is much more considered to be a science of the mind. It's a very logical, reason-based mind science, actually. And the person known as the Buddha, he was not a prophet. He was not a religion founder. You know, he was not at all interested in religious games, Lama Yeshe would say. But he was a discoverer an investigator into the nature of reality, a discoverer into our human potential. He was a scientist of his time, actually, a scientist of the mind. He was the discoverer, or we could say he was celebrated back then, as the discoverer of causation, the law of cause and effect, especially when it comes to causation with respect to our inner world, mental causation, spiritual causation. The Buddha saw very clearly that just as in the physical world around us, the law of cause and effect is operating, that everything that we see in our external environment arises in dependence upon causes and conditions. 
and is therefore completely impermanent and does not actually possess any self-nature. In the same way, also our minds arise in dependence upon causes and conditions and are therefore also impermanent. They are changeable. If one understands that, that one's present mind is the product of causes and conditions, if one understands how the law of cause and effect with respect to our one's inner world manifests and unfolds, then one can influence that, you see. One can start to work with conditions. Through familiarization, one can transform one's mind. One can transform any emotional harmful state in the mind into a beneficial, healthy state by working with conditions. And this is what meditation is, actually. This is what meditation means, you know. It's such a fancy word, meditation. But that's what it refers to, which we will look at in a minute. If we learn this well, we can actually lead our minds gradually, step by step, to a state of perfect, lasting mental health, which is what enlightenment means, basically. That's really, that's really what it means. Liberation, enlightenment, these terms refer to a lasting, non-changing anymore <laughs> state of perfect mental health which the Buddha achieved. Okay. And then, after the Buddha has achieved a state of perfect inner mental health, called enlightenment in Buddhist terms, he shared these methods, how to achieve that state, with others. He shared the methods that he himself has discovered and used with everyone else who is interested, basically, to use it themselves. To also reach that state, because we are all in the position to be able to do so. It just depends on doing the work, inner work, that is, working on the mind. So now, one thing that I always found very inspiring, when the Buddha started to share his methods, when he shared his experience with others, he always very strongly emphasized his students, his followers, whoever listened to him, not just to believe what he says out of blind faith, you know, not just thinking, oh wow, that's the Buddha, and he says, he preaches these things, therefore they must be true. No, he very much urged his followers, his disciples, to critically evaluate every word he says and to put the teachings to the test in their own experience not just following them out of respect for the Buddha. In our own experience, we have to practice and check them. And I find this very inspiring, actually. We really have to critically evaluate what he teaches and think and check. Is that really true or not? So there is this famous quote I always share, coming from the Buddha himself, when the Buddha said, O big shoes and wise ones, just as a goldsmith would test the gold by burning, cutting, and rubbing it, so you must examine my words, but not accept them merely out of respect for me. So just as a goldsmith, you know, when he or she goes to the market to buy an ounce of gold, she would check, right, okay, before I give my money for it, I check if I actually get my money's worth, you know, by cutting the gold and rubbing it and burning it. And, you know, you really check, is that really gold? Otherwise, I will not buy it. In the same way, when it comes to spiritual matters, actually, especially when it comes to spiritual matters, before we accept any technique or anything, we should really check, is it actually worthwhile to do so? Is this teaching valid or not? That's how we should approach the teaching of the Buddha. That's how, how we should check reality. Not merely through believing in something. Okay. And this approach of learning is presented in this tradition in what is called the Three Wisdoms. The Three Wisdoms, 
start first of all with the wisdom of hearing, sometimes translated as the wisdom of listening. First of all, we simply listen to these new ideas that the Buddha is sharing with us, what he says. You know, we just hear these instructions, we hear these methods first of all. We keep an open mind, a relaxed mind, we kind of stay unbiased and just simply give these things a chance, making contact with the teachings of the Buddha. And that's already a form of wisdom here. It's already you know, treated as a form of wisdom to listen correctly, hearing these things. Okay. After we make first contact with the teachings, with these instructions, we practice the second wisdom, which is called the wisdom of contemplation. And in the wisdom of contemplation, we start thinking about what we've heard. We start to analyze thoroughly what we have been listening to. We maybe go to the library, check a book on it, go deeper. We discuss it with friends, with other people who also listen to it. You know, really checking things out from various angles and really investigating and contemplating what the Buddha is trying to tell us here. Gaining understanding. And with these two, the wisdom of hearing and the wisdom of contemplation, we can, if we practice them correctly, gain quite a solid understanding about a subject matter. We can, you know, gain quite a good intellectual understanding of a particular topic. But I think, as we all know from our own experience, intellectual knowledge is not enough to actually change our minds. Being expert on a topic intellectually is not actually going to change our behavior. It's not going to influence our daily actions as such. I think we know that quite well. To really change our minds for the better, to bring our intellectual, intellectual knowledge from up here, the head, down to an experiential level, the heart, we have to practice the third wisdom, which is called the wisdom of meditation bringing our intellectual understanding to an experiential level, from the head to the heart. That the teachings or these methods really make an impact to our life, really changing our mind for the better, for a long-lasting, true change within us. You know? This will actually give us, if practiced correctly, not only an intellectual understanding, which is important, which is necessary, but then it will lead us to a direct experience, really change our mind, eventually gaining real realizations on the path to enlightenment. So based on listening and contemplating, we meditate on what we've understood. And this progression here is really the key to transforming our minds for the better, to become free through understanding, both on an intellectual level and experiential level. So I would like to talk a little bit more about this third wisdom here, about this wisdom of meditation, that we, you know, this word meditation, we hear it a lot. Many of us might actually practice meditation already. There's all these kinds of ideas of what meditation actually is presented from so many traditions, from so many angles, in so many different ways, but I think many of us might not actually be aware of what meditation really means. Because if I say the word meditation, every one of you might have a different idea of what that is, I guess so. Sometimes, introducing this, it's easier to talk about what meditation is not than talking about what it is, you know. First of all, I think it's important to mention that meditation is not simply a relaxation technique. It's not just something that we do in order to calm our minds down with the movement of the breath, only keeping our mind quiet in a concentrated state without thoughts. Nothing wrong with these things, you know, don't get me wrong, but that's not the only thing that meditation is for. We shouldn't limit meditation on just that, relaxing and calming the mind. 
as Lama Yeshe would say in his book, Freedom Through Understanding, ordinary people think that the purpose of meditation is to make the mind calm and peaceful, but that's not enough. Of course, when you create a calm, peaceful environment, you can integrate your mind and make it calm and peaceful, but that's not liberation. Liberation is complete freedom from the uncontrolled, up-and-down, selfish mind. So we see freedom, uh, meditation, is not just you know, something that we do in order to feel good also, to kind of have a blissful feeling, to sit down and close our eyes and get into a trance where we forget about the world around us and just bliss out. It can be a part of meditation to feel blissful, to have a blissful inner feeling, that's okay, but that's not what it's about, you see. In the same way, meditation is not just a way to escape the world and go into our own little bubble in our meditation room, away from our problems, going into our meditation to escape our problems. No. But in fact, it actually is a technique how we can develop ourselves from within to then deal with our problems and challenges in our day-to-day -day life more effectively, more skillfully. Okay. So, what, when we talk about meditation, this word meditation actually is the translation of the Tibetan word gom. Gom is the Tibetan word that we usually translate as meditation. But the actual connotation of the Tibetan word gom is to become familiar with something, to get to know something. We could also say to understand something clearly, right? Familiarizing our minds with something. With what? To get to know what? Understanding what? Well, first of all, understanding what our own minds are, actually. The characteristics of our own minds, how the mind functions. And then from within that understanding, beginning to familiarize ourselves with positive aspects of the mind, virtuous, healthy, beautiful states of mind, such as kindness, compassion, love, joy, confidence, patience, humility, generosity, wisdom, serenity. And then learning methods on how to increase these mind states and make them more prominent in our minds for our day-to-day -day experience, to share them with others around us. And we do so also by way of identifying and acknowledging our harmful states of mind, our disturbing emotions, our delusions, such as attachment, greed, anger, jealousy, pride, low self-esteem, anxiety, fear, you name it. Whatever state of mind causes, that causes us to suffer, to feel unwell, to feel unpeaceful, Learning what these states of mind are actually all about, where they are coming from, how we can work with them skillfully, and cultivating methods from within how to work with them skillfully, to gradually decrease them, make them less prominent in our mind, to have more space for peace. This is what meditation is, okay? what it is for. So therefore we can really say that, you know, apart, really uh, far from meditation being just something very mystical or otherworldly that we meditate somewhere in the Himalayas, you know, meditation really is a series of very practical, very sophisticated psychological techniques on how to work with our minds, how to cultivate the mind. Because an uncultivated mind causes us a lot of problems. 
not only ourselves, but also the people that have to live with us. You know? If we are overwhelmed by delusions, if we are overwhelmed by disturbing emotions. So it's so important to, to learn about them, you know, to understand them more. Because we all have delusions, don't we? Is there anyone here in this afternoon's talk who does not have delusions, negative thoughts, harmful inner states? I think we're all in the same boat in that, aren't we? Very much so. But have we actually ever learned about what the nature of them is? Have we ever learned where negative emotions are coming from? Have we learned how to acknowledge them and deal with them in a way that we can take care of them? I don't think so, so much. I haven't learned it in school. I wish I had. This is what meditation is about. Okay. So we are all subject to delusions and disturbing emotions. We are all the same in that. And from the Buddhist perspective, it is these very delusions, our own disturbing emotions, it is, which, is the cause, which are the cause for our suffering. In Buddhism, we see very clearly that the source of our suffering, the source of our own problems, is not actually lying outside of ourselves. Just as the source of happiness doesn't lie outside of ourselves, also the source of suffering doesn't lie out there coming to us, making us suffer. It lies within our own minds. This is not how we usually see things, not at all. It's very contrary to our intuitive way of seeing things. We usually think, you know, I am unhappy because I don't have enough money, I don't have a relationship, I am judged by my friends and I don't have enough friends, my best friend said something nasty to me, I don't have time to go traveling, whatever it might be, right? We have all these reasons thinking, yeah, there's these outer conditions, yes, but they can become a condition for us to feel unhappy, but the Buddha goes deeply, more deeper than that. And he would say, hey, your actual cause, the actual root for your unhappiness is not these outer conditions. It's in your mind. The seed of suffering is in your own mind. It comes from, arises from within the mind. It comes from our own deluded perspective, basically. So it's our own disturbing emotions and the actions that we create, what we do with our body, speech and mind, influenced by our disturbing emotions, which become the cause for suffering, which are the origin for unhappiness. They are actually what cause us to be unhappy. And the Buddha would say the less delusions we have in our minds, the greater inner peace and self-worth we will experience. So the most serious disturbing emotions that we experience are attachment and anger. Attachment, desire and hatred towards self and others. Attachment, you know, is this ego-driven craving for pleasant experiences that we have. It's this neurotic sense of wanting something pleasant for me, always looking out for some happiness to get because we feel empty inside. And the main characteristic of attachment is that it exaggerates the attractive or pleasant aspects of a certain object or person or thing, activity, place. It exaggerates that, blows it out of proportion and then wishes to have it, wishes to possess it. You know? Thinking, this outer thing or that person or that place is the source of my happiness. I need to make it mine. So we can say attachment is that mistaken mind that apprehends pleasantness in a mistaken, exaggerated way. And anger, on the other hand, 
is this ego-driven aversion that we have if unpleasant things happen. You know? It arises when our attachment does not get what it wants, when some things happen in our life that we do not want to happen. You know? And its main characteristic is that anger exaggerates the unpleasant aspects of a certain situation, person, or thing, or place, blows that out of proportion, and then generates this huge drama in the mind, wishing to get rid of it, wanting it out of our lives, wishing to harm. You know? Seeing that particular person, place, or thing as the source for my unhappiness. So, anger or hatred, we can say, apprehends the unpleasant aspects of an object in an exaggerated, deluded way. It's mistaken with respect to unpleasant things. And these two, attachment for the good things and strong neurotic aversion for unpleasant things, are rooted in what we call ignorance. Our not knowing, our active misapprehending of how things are, our not understanding how reality exists. Specifically, it refers to our grasping at a real self-existent me here and real self-existent other out there. An inherent I and mine and inherent others which become a threat to me and my happiness. Due to ignorance, you know, as I keep talking about this kind of factor in the mind, misapprehending the nature of how things are, we see ourselves as a self-existent person here, separate from everyone else, and these self-existent others out there, you know, some of them like me, and they are my friends, they are cool, but some of them don't like me, and I really have to get rid of them, and there's all these strangers out there that I don't know, and they are all a bit weird, Maybe they, you know, they're threatening me. We have that feeling, you know, we totally not see the interconnectedness and interrelatedness of all beings and all people. We do not see the fundamental interconnection and codependence that we as a sentient being and other living beings actually have with each other. This is what ignorance does. It grasps at separateness at inherent me, inherent others. And therefore, because of that, we do not actually really understand our own place in the world that we share with each and every living being. So the Buddha has identified our minds are mistaken, you know, these forms. We have mistaken ideas about how things are. And it is these three, actually, attachment, anger and ignorance, which in Buddhist terms are called the three poisons, from which all other delusional mind states actually arise within our mind. You know, greed and pride and envy, hate, jealousy, guilt, whatever causes our minds to be unpeaceful, whatever agitates our minds, arises basically from these three poisons, attachment, aversion and ignorance. So sometimes in the teachings, you know, ignorance is compared as being like the root of a tree, you know, where everything comes from. And attachment and anger are like the stem of a tree. And then every other delusion, every other form of suffering we experience in the mind are like the branches of the tree, you see. So in our life, if we start to begin to cut the branches, you know, we cut various delusions, you know, diminishing our delusions by applying the right techniques to, you know, overcome pride, overcome greed and envy, overcome guilt and jealousy. That's wonderful. That's very good. We, we need to do that. And there are various ways within the Buddhist tradition to meditate on the various antidotes to bring about the positive counterforces in our mind to overcome these negative states and experience more happiness in our day-to-day -day life. Definitely. But fundamentally, on the long run, you know, if we cut the branches of a tree here and there, they're going to regrow. 
because the root is still there. If you want to finally, really put an end to suffering in the mind, then we have to look at the root of the problem, which is these three poisons, attachment, anger, and fundamentally our ignorance that misapprehends the nature of the, how things are. Instead, what we have to do is we have to develop the wisdom that sees how things are. Okay. I mean, it sounds quite, it's quite simple, actually. Sounds simple. Not so simple to do, but we have to train our minds in actually becoming more familiar with how reality actually exists. In Buddhist terms, developing wisdom. If we develop the wisdom that sees the lack of an inherent me and an inherent mine, inherent others, that sees the interconnected nature of all phenomena and living beings in the universe, then attachment and anger, these factors that distort and exaggerate our you know, things in the world, pleasantness or unpleasantness, they cannot really arise anymore because its building block Ignorance has been overcome. So instead of anger and attachment, we start to develop love, appreciation for others, wishing others to be happy and have the causes of happiness that is free from exaggeration, but based on wisdom. We develop the patience that sees when unpleasant things happen in my life, I don't immediately go into drama, and freak out, but I understand with patience the various causes and conditions that led to that unpleasantness. And I develop a state of, you know, we call it patience, which means being able to bear and live peacefully with an unpleasant situation, instead of going into a tantrum and freaking out, because things don't work the way I want them to work, you get, you, you know? And from there then, all the other delusional states we usually experience in our mind cannot arise anymore. But instead, the beautiful, positive, healthy states of mind, such as self-confidence, feeling inspired, being kind, having tolerance, respect, interconnection, well-being, arise within our minds and become more stable. You see, this is what the goal in Buddhism is to develop this green tree instead of the red tree, okay, basically. So now here, what I would like to get at is, what I want to highlight now, the incredible thing about Buddha's psychology is that the Buddha says that not only monkey coming, not only, we love you, we love you, but we have to be, yeah. Hey. The Buddha says, not only can we diminish our disturbing emotions, not only can we, you know, make our disturbing emotions less prominent in the mind and decrease them and make them less in our minds, which is wonderful, you know, but through meditation and applying these three steps of wisdom correctly, we can actually completely remove any disturbing emotion from our mind stream forever. We can totally rid our minds from any harmful state whatsoever, forever. This is where the Buddha's view differs, I think, from modern psychology. Most probably, I think so. Right. Because we can all agree that if we work on our minds, we can diminish our anger, yes. I think we can all agree with that, you know? That there's something we can kind of decrease and make less prominent, but to completely remove anger from our mind without a trace, so that it, it will never ever arise again, no matter the outer circumstances. That, I think, is a bit more difficult to accept for us to even think that this is a possibility. But in Buddha's psychology, this is asserted. This is possible. This is our potential. You see? 
If we remove ignorance, seeing things unclearly, being confused, through correct understanding, correct knowing, developing wisdom, all delusions, the whole, the whole tree of delusional mind states will collapse, will be removed, will be gone. And our true nature will become manifest. And from the Buddha's perspective, our true nature, the actual nature of our minds, is free from disturbing emotions, free from delusions. The actual nature of our minds, your mind, my mind, her mind, his mind, is not stained by negative emotions at all. It is clarity. It is purity. It is luminous spaciousness. And our disturbing emotions, our attachments, angers, prides, our, you know, things that cause us to suffer, they are just temporarily there due to causes and conditions. Because we grasp reality in a mistaken way, basically. That's the reason why we experience negative emotions, you see. Whereas the actual nature of our minds is clarity, is purity. And when we overcome our own wrong views in here, then this clear, pure nature will become truly apparent, we could say. And I would like to share with you what Lama Yeshe has to say about this, because he can explain that, or give voice to that in a much more beautiful way than I can, actually. Hmm. Oh, uh, the Buddhist, you know, uh, mm, mm, Tantra teachings and, um, you know, mm, mm, Tantra and Sutra, both says, you know, human mind is clean, clear light. Clean, clear mind. Mm-hmm. So, what I'm saying, the natural, the natural, uh, our, our consciousness, our consciousness is, uh, you understand? Uh, it has been, it has been clean, clean. It is clean, clean. It will be clean, clean. You understand? So that you, you know, you don't need to worry about. Mm. Then we talk about the delusion, confusion. What about that one? <laughs> mm. Mm. You know? oh. Delusion is you know, not the, our conscious character. The cloud is not characteristic of sky. You know? That have to change attitude, have to change. You know, fundamentally, sometimes we are wrong, you know, thinking that, you know, me is the Delusion, bad guy, you know, who always does bad, bad, bad thinking, who always does bad action. You understand? You put the whole me is the... It's not true. You know? Oh. You cannot make limitation even your own reality. You, you cannot. You should not. So each of us, we have problem, we are difficult, but you have something similar, Buddha, Bodhisattva, energy within you. You know, we do. 
We do. We do. Lama Yesha is, what Lama Yesha is talking about here is that usually we are limiting ourselves far too much. We are identifying ourselves with the wrong thing, usually in our lives. We identify ourselves with our limited delusion attitude. But he says we have to make a fundamental shift, a fundamental change by identifying our inner potential through understanding nature of reality clearly that we have something which is like a Buddha energy within us. We have Buddha nature. Each and every one of us can achieve a state of complete inner freedom through understanding. I'm coming back there again and again, but that's the t name of the talk. Our mind's actual nature is clarity. It is peaceful. It is calmness. It is spacious and luminous, clear. But at the moment, it is temporarily obscured. It is influenced by delusions. It is agitated by our mental afflictions. We have all these words, right? Delusions, disturbing emotions, mental defilements, mental afflictions, all of them referring to the same thing. It's these negative thoughts, we can say, the negative self-talk, that the negative chatterbox that is constantly on, radio, I am not good enough, radio, I have, you know, which makes our mind unpeaceful and causes us to feel so insecure and confused, these things, these conditions, these disturbing emotions, they are only temporarily there. Like Lama Yishi would say, like clouds in the sky. There's various analogies for that, right? Right now here in Dharamsala, we are enjoying incredibly vast blue skies, right? We look into the sky and it's, it's complete clarity, actually. It's vastness. And actually, in Buddhism we would say, the nature of your mind is like the sky. Completely open, luminous. There is no beginning or end in the sky, no? If you go out after and you look into the sky, you think, where does that end? Right. The sky is also here, basically. It's, it's open. Your mind, by nature, is the same. And although sometimes, you know, clouds move through the sky, and in a few months from now, monsoon is starting, and you look into the sky and you think, oi, there's no sky there. It's only clouds, thick, th you know, thick, dark thunderclouds. And we think, oh God, there is no sky anymore. This is, you know, and it goes on month after month, and we're just kind of identifying with the clouds. I know, I've been here through a few monsoons. You start to identify <laughs> with the monsoon clouds, but that's... That's just a temporary phenomena, right? It will go away again. Behind the clouds, there is always the clarity and spaciousness of the sky. In the same way, our minds are very much the same. Although at the moment, it's very you know, clouded by our disturbing emotions. Behind that, the clarity of your nature is always present. But we usually don't recognize, because we identify with the wrong thing. Another analogy I always like to give is that at the moment, our minds are like boiling water. You see, when you make pasta and you boil water on a stove, you see boiling water is there, and boiling water is completely agitated, isn't it? It's boiling, right? So you cannot reflect your face on the surface of the water. You cannot have a sip from the water. It's boiling. Why is it boiling? because heat is applied to it, right? That's the reason. As soon as you take off the pot of water, if you take it off the stove and put it aside, the boiling in a matter of seconds will stop. And although it's still burning hot and steam is coming and you cannot have a sip from it yet, 
we know that if we leave it off the stove, away from the condition of fire, heating it up, the water will cool down and we can reflect our face in its surface and we can have a nice sip from it and enjoy it. In the same way, although at the moment our minds are boiling because of our own disturbing emotions, our own wrong way of thinking, if we manage to diminish you know, our wrong way of thinking, the boiling will stop. And just as boiling water and still water, both are water, right? It's not the case that, you know, you see the water is clear now, that the clarity of the water wasn't there when the water was boiling. It was there, obviously. It was just in a very agitated state. In the same way, right now, our minds, in this very moment, you see, our clarity, but they are just agitated. We have to turn off the stove. We have to, you know, remove the heat, the fire of delusions that burns our minds. In this analogy, of course, the fire is an external condition, but with respect to our mind, the condition is internal. It's our own delusions. One more analogy you like, maybe? I have one more prepared right here for you. At the moment, we can say the mind is like a glass of dirty water. You know, if you have a glass of dirty water, you are in India, you are traveling through India, and somebody offers you in one daba down the road a glass of dirty water, like, you know, have it. Like, Thank you very much. I already had a daily belly. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, you know. But we know when you take the water, and you pour it through a filtering system, like the beautiful filtering systems we have here in Tushita, then what will come out after you have filtered the water is pure water again. And you, you know, the, the dirt has been filtered away because the dirt is not of the same entity as the water. You see? The water does not have dirt character but it's just something temporarily there. It can be taken away. You can have a good, clear, healthy sip of water. In the same way, if we pour our minds through the filtering system of these methods of how to understand more correctly and practice that well, we can filter our minds free, make them free from any delusion because the nature of clarity is already given. We don't have to get it from somewhere, you see. We don't have to go out to the market and buy in a clarity. We don't have to bargain for it with somebody, you know. You don't have to beg for it. Please give me clarity. You already have it. It's just obscured. So we have to start to recognize, and as Lama Yeshe says, we have to change our attitude of thinking, oh, I'm the bad guy, I can't do it, I'm always wrong, you know, it's too difficult. Say, so you have Buddha nature, Lama Yeshi would say. You have this potential to make that change. It is possible, you know. The basic clarity of the mind is unaffected by temporal disturbing emotions, which means a state of perfect peace is possible is attainable. The basis for that is already there. It's already with you. A Buddha is somebody who has a mind that is completely at peace. A Buddha has purified his or her mind totally, has taken away any disturbing factor from their mind streams and attained a state of perfect clarity. You know, the Tibetan word for Buddha is Sangye. That's the Tibetan word that we translate as a Buddha. And these two syllables have very beautiful meaning. The first syllable, Sang, actually means the total elimination of all obscurations. The complete eradication of any psychological, neurotic problem in our minds. Okay. Whereas the second syllable, Gye, refers to having completed all realizations, having developed all the inner goodness, all the inner positive mind states based on wisdom, having developed the wisdom that realizes 
emptiness of inherent existence, total interconnectedness, and developed perfect compassion and love for each and every living being, realizing the interconnected nature of all life. This is what a Buddha is, okay? And the nature of Buddhahood is within you al already, you know. So I find this very inspiring to see what these two syllables mean because they, see, they show us exactly what work we have to do. Recognize our own mistaken views, overcome them by gaining correct understanding, practicing that over a long period of time, eliminating obscurations, completely gaining realizations of reality. This is possible for us. This is what we can do. It depends on how we work with our minds. So concluding, Buddhist practice is about the mind, becoming familiar with our inner world, seeing, yes, there are positive, healthy, beautiful mind states that I want to increase, but there is also these harmful mind states that I want to diminish. You know, at the moment, I can't control them. At the moment, it's completely all over the place. So we need to begin to check and see, okay, you know, just because a negative thought arises within you doesn't mean it's true. Doesn't mean it's reality. You don't have to follow it like your mind throwing a stick and you like a dog running behind it. That's what we usually do. We take the stick and bring it back to our mind and our mind takes it, throws it again, and over and over, we entertain the same problem again and again, and we are not very skillful with dealing with the problem. You see, so we need to learn methods of how to analyze our thoughts more correctly. You know, developing the skill to recognizing what is my mind doing? Is this useful? Is this correct? You know? If not. Why am I following it all the time? Changing our habits. We can train our minds. Our minds, as Lama Zubar Rinpoche would say, we can mold our minds into any shape we want. The basic nature, we, we can form it, we can train it, we can tame it, we can develop it. And the method of how to do this or at least to gain some inspiration that we can do this, is what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. This is our potential. And we should begin to start to gain confidence in this, because this world really screams, it shouts for more wisdom and more compassion in our hearts, isn't it? We've had enough self-centeredness and confusion going on. Now it's really time to tap into our own potential and see, whoa, I can do this. So, let's get to work. How? Well, this we'll discuss next time, in the next episode of Freedom Through Understanding. Okay. I thought maybe that's enough from my side here. Maybe we can have some questions. I know we have also a few people on Zoom, maybe. So I was thinking if there's any questions from in here and on Zoom, we can do one question from in here and one from Zoom, alternating a little bit. If there are any questions, we can have them. Maybe we can also have answers. I'm not sure. Are there any questions? Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Since through the Buddhist teachings, we learn that... Um, that uh, there should not be any dependence on the external world, on mm. people and on things for our own happiness. Uh, what is the, what should be the importance of the presence of a significant other in our lives? You mean another person? Yes. Well, I think when you say, what I think the difference we have to make is, that, yeah, that there are outer conditions, other people, places, things, objects, which become a condition for us to feel happy and well and confident and have a happy life. But on a very fundamental level, if we make all our well-being dependent upon outer circumstances, which 
on the long run we do not actually have control over since things change people come people go things arise stay for a while and pass away again if we make all our well-being dependent on outer factors which we don't have control over that means in the end we don't have control over our own well-being would you agree or not so therefore it's very good to have this backup plan to see well if outer beautiful conditions are present i enjoy them i can go along with them i live with them i appreciate them but when they fall away from my life when things suddenly change and that significant other suddenly decides not to be my significant other anymore because whatever reason he or she or they have when suddenly my favorite thing breaks or my one most wonderful place has changed then on a fundamental level i'm not shocked i'm not thrown off the horse i know aha impermanence is unfolding change has happened this is the nature of things i should have expected it actually you see so we start to rely more on the wisdom as i been talking about that understands these conditions more as they are so that when they are around of course we can have this other person in our life and grow together work together live together but you see what do we know what's going to happen tomorrow next month if you completely that's what attachment then does <laughs> is like what attachment does the function of attachment says you are the source of my happiness you make me so happy you are my significant other half you make me whole what does that mean if we say you make me whole it means without you i am not whole i am not complete and that brings up the potential for a lot of suffering as we all know too well so like that the buddha is pointing to don't put all your trust on an exaggerated way of seeing things in this wrong light but see hey things change and be prepared you know what i mean so that's something to think about i guess yeah thank you maybe we have one from zoom yeah yes while understanding that the afflictions arise from our minds and are not merely caused by external phenomena how do we avoid the pitfall of self blame could verbal clarify the correct view to manage this when we know that the delusions have their root in the mind how can we avoid the pitfall of self blame well yeah, okay i understand yeah well when we say you see that delusions arise from within our minds it doesn't mean that our minds are a breeding ground for delusions and that this is its nature thinking i blame myself of oh, i'm bad my mind is so bad because so many delusions arise from my mind you know that that's that's not the case the thing is we have to understand why are delusions arising in my mind delusions arise in my mind because we have habituated ourselves for such a long time with wrong views and with the delusions that arise from wrong views we are so habituated to them we have followed them and trusted them for such a long time that they have kind of we have the feeling they have become our nature that we have the feeling that this is who i really am and if you identify yourself with your attachment with your anger with your low self esteem with your jealousy and think this is what i am then self blame comes about right oh i'm here i'm again also then self blame arises what is self blame what is guilt it basically is a form of aversion towards ourselves actually guilt is defined as anger and the object of that anger is me and it's so painful 
It's so horrible to experience self-blame and guilt, beating ourselves up over and over again for mistakes we have made due to delusions in the past, for having, you know, whatever we have done in the past that, you know, was a mistake. We keep beating ourselves up because we think that this is who I am. I am a bad person because of my delusions. But that's a completely invalid understanding. That's not correct. As I tried to explain, our actual nature is clarity, is purity, is openness. But due to conditions over the past, you know, we have habituated ourselves to wrong views, that they come about, they take over, and cause us to engage in actions of body and speech that harm others and ourselves and create suffering. But that comes from the delusions, from wrong views, which can be eliminated. So instead of blaming ourselves for our current situation of having delusions and having made mistakes due to them, we should start to, as Lama Yeshe says, change our attitude and start to identify with our inner potential to be able to overcome them from within and then engage in virtuous behavior. Does that make sense, dear Zoom person? I don't, oh, okay, can I actually see you here? Who was that question from? Who are you? Can I? Are you? Here you are. Does it make sense a bit? Okay, thank you. Maybe one more question from in here. Well, as the heading of the session says, uh, freedom through understanding. And you've to uh, talked about state of mind, delusion, attachment, and anger and all that. How does one differentiate between, let's say, delusion and wisdom? How does one di differentiate between delusion and wisdom? Yeah. How do you come to know? How, what's that feeling inside? Okay, you mean experientially? Yeah. Well, that's very difficult, isn't it? Because we have taken our delusions as being with reality. As it just arises, right? Okay. I would think it's a really very good question. How is a delusion defined and how is wist or like yeah. wisdom defined? Well, a delusion first of all, is based on exaggeration. It's based on ignorance. It's based on not being in harmony with the nature of reality. A delusion is an exaggeration, is a distortion. It is, causes the mind to be agitated and unpeaceful. That's the actual definition of a delusion, is a factor in the mind which causes the mind to be unpeaceful. So when you feel your mind is unpeaceful, what is that? Meaning, you know, how do we feel when we are unpeaceful? Body, body and mind are, we are nervous. We cannot just sit and be. I mean, just to sit and experience the present moment for what it is, there is some pleasant conditions some unpleasant conditions, the present moment manifests in a particular way, but usually our inner box goes on and on and on, and we think about what happened in the past, or what will happen in the future, and we are rarely present in the moment right now. We are drawn to hoping for something in the future, or fearing for something in the future, or fantasizing about what has happened in the past, shouldn't have happened, what I should have said, why didn't I react like this, why did she do that? And our minds are unpeaceful. Whereas wisdom and the states of mind like love, kindness, patience, compassion, are states that arise from wisdom. They are states which are in accordance with reality. They are not based on exaggeration and discordance. They are based on understanding how things are. I am one living being, other numberless living beings out there as well. Everyone wanting to be happy, not wanting to suffer. We are all equal in that. So when we see that interconnectedness, 
that, as His Holiness the Lama would always mention, that we are all one family of different brother, sister, sentient beings. Mm. And we let go of the delusion that thinks, I am the most important one here. I am the center of the universe. Grasping at an inherent self and then cherishing that self as something most important. Then we dive into or tap into the more fundamental reality of interconnectedness and seeing I am just one of so many other ones as well. And maybe my happiness is not more important than everyone else's happiness as well. So to overcome that self-centered mind based on the wisdom that sees I am not the most important thing in the world. That's just one take on it. That's in accordance with reality. That's how we differentiate delusion and wisdom. Does it answer your question a bit? More or less. Okay. Is there one more from Zoom? Three. Let's have one first. How can we be with an intimate partner and not get trapped in attachment and inevitable craving or pain when this comes to an end sooner or later? Well, I don't know why you ask me. I'm a monk. I don't have this problem. I don't know about these things. An intimate partner. Can you read the question again? How can we be with an intimate partner and not get trapped in attachment and inevitable craving or pain when this comes to an end sooner or later? When the relationship comes to an end sooner or later, yeah. Very difficult. Because if we are with an intimate partner, why are we with an intimate partner in the first place usually? Usually because the love that we have for someone else is totally mixed with attachment is totally overcome with, I want you to make me happy. Attachment says, I want you to make me happy. Whereas actual love says, I want you to be happy. That's a big difference. Attachment is ego-driven, based on my needs, my wants, thinking, you are my intimate partner, and if you leave me, I'm going to be totally distraught and dissatisfied. Because our relationship might, to this intimate partner in the first place might be based on a wrong motivation. Please make me happy. If you stop making me happy, doing and saying the things that I like, then I'm not so, so sure about if I want to be together with you anymore. Whereas actual love means... I want you to be happy. I want to become a cause for your happiness. If your happiness involves me, that's wonderful. If your happiness, whatever you need for happiness, does not involve me, then that's okay as well. That's difficult for us to hear though. Because we want to be needed by someone. We are attached to somebody else and we want them to be attached to us. Usually that's what our relationships are built on. And then when one attachment is disappointed over time, all this drama comes up and we get completely crazy. Because from the very beginning, the motivation why we engage in a relationship is often completely controlled by attachment. So, I think the answer, or one answer would be is, Look at your motivation of why you are engaging in that relationship in the first place. What is the motivation that why are you together with that person? Why are you intimate with that person? The more attachment you have in your relationship, the more you will suffer, period, basically. Attachment is a cause for suffering. It will always lead us to suffering because it is based on the exaggeration that this person is the source for your happiness. And if this person changes, your happiness changes and you freak out. So if you can diminish your attachment, which doesn't mean you diminish your love, 
actually it's the opposite. The more you diminish attachment, the more space for true love is actually there, true appreciation, real enjoyment. The more you are able to do that, the happier you can be. And if that relationship then comes to an end, well, we'll still might be sad about it, you know. It's not that we become robots and say, I am fine if you leave me, I love you, no attachment. It just means, okay, now this has changed, right? That's very sad. I wish it would have lasted. But on a fundamental level, you can deal with it in a much more skillful way. We still might be sad about it, right? Which is a natural emotion that arises. But you, you'll get over it and be able to you continue your life in a much more easy way than if attachment has this grip on you. So we have to, as Venerable Rubina would always say, we have to differentiate between the attachment and the love. At the moment they are mixed together like one thing and we don't know the difference. So again, we have to apply the wisdom that sees what is attachment. How does it manifest in my mind? What is its nature? How does it see reality? Does it see reality clearly or not? If not, isn't that setting me up for suffering from the very beginning? How can I now diminish it? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. I'm sorry. The digression here. Oh God, now I have this for the rest of the day. Love is, you know, what, what is that state of mind? How does that feel like? How do I cultivate that one? How can I increase that? And how can I eventually maybe find a state of being together with a partner and with someone where there's equal support for that positive emotion and the, an equal working together and partnering up to identify this negative emotion and be able to smile at it and see, okay, we, you know, we're together knowing our attachments. Talk about it, you know. Be honest with it. Speak with each other, you know, instead of hiding your attachment in there and hoping the other person will act exactly as you want and then freaking out if they don't. You know what I mean. I'm talking and talking, but... So, the less attachment, the more happiness, Lama Zuburimpishi would say. The less attachment, the more freedom through understanding. Okay, I think we maybe have to end it here because otherwise it gets so long. Thank you so very much for um, coming in. Maybe let's just have one minute of uh, dedication together. So in the end, we try to give the positive potential that we have accumulated by thinking about these subjects, to give it the right direction, to dedicate the positive potential accumulated. And we can simply give rise to the thought that having understood or having come into contact with the idea that the basic nature of our minds is actually free of disturbing emotions. That, our, that we all have Buddha nature, the potential to become a Buddha, a completely happy and fulfilled human being, and to help others to do the same, may we be able to identify that and make this Buddha nature flourish in our lives by overcoming temporal afflictions and finding the right antidote of wisdom and compassion in our lives. May the wisdom and compassion which has not yet arisen within us arise and manifest and may that wisdom and compassion which has already arisen within us never diminish but increase and grow increase and grow more and more
in this way may this session become a cause for our own and others ultimate well-being and happiness which means liberation and full enlightenment to be able to help all sentient beings to develop the same.